we just have to stay humble, you know. And <laughs> we got to make sure we know how to handle success and all those things, uh, so we can't change who we are. Now that's a classic case of if you just hear something, maybe take away the laughter, you would have no idea that Ryan Fitzpatrick was dressed up in Deshaun Jackson's wardrobe and his jewelry and everything. One of those, you had to be there. Roy Cummings was there, and he's going to join us in just a second. Welcome to A Few Extra Bucks, everybody, here on PewterPirates.com. I'm your host, Mike Neighbors. Uh, we'd like to thank our title sponsors, House of Brews and Lutes on the corner of Northdale Mabry and Van Dyke and Sea Dog Brewing Company, two great locations in Clearwater and Treasure Island on the beach uh, I'm going to bring in uh, Justin Thomas and Roy Cummings. Justin, uh, our producer, has brought in some great sound from Dirk Cutter. We, we, he kind of touches everything, doesn't he? Yes. And also, can I say, I wish I looked half as cool as Ryan F- Fitzpatrick did on Sunday. <laughs> That's a great point, Justin. You know why? Because, well, think about it, not too many guys can pull that off. No, he pulled it off amazingly. He really did. That, that was the best thing about it. He pulled it off. I mean, it worked. You don't see that working too often. You know, to your guys' point, you know, I can't see Drew Brees pulling it off at all. I, I can't see Matt no. Ryan pulling it off. No. And I can see Cam Newton trying to pull it off but not pulling it off, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I, it's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, to, to even try it, as gutsy as, as it is, and then to pull it off, man, that's, uh, hey, that's, that, but that's the Fitz magic working right there. And Roy, it was the deadpan, wasn't it? The deadpan look <laughs> is what, was, what made it, right? You were there. Thought, yes. And here's the thing. This guy's got a future on, you know, in TV. He, they should give him a Saturday Night Live uh, hosting gig before uh, before the magic runs out because, uh, you know, when the gold dust uh, runs out here, uh, he, they got to get it now because he, he's got that. He can do the deadpan, man. You know what made me feel really old? I heard a Ryan Fitzpatrick interview on Dan Patrick today. And, and he was saying, you know, they, Dan asked him about his age. And he said, yeah, you know, a lot of guys, you know, they give me a hard time when they play new music at practice. Like, hey, oh, hey, Grandpa, you ever heard of that? And he kind of called out to Mar Dotson, listen, buddy, you're as old as me. And this, <laughs> but this reference, and, and Justin can relate to it because Justin's younger than us, Roy. But Fitz, Fitz says, sometimes I throw things at the young players, and they don't get it. And, he's, and his example of that was Saved by the Bell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I heard that, and, and I'm like, Wait a minute that 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 that's your comeback, saved yeah. by the bell, which made me feel old, frankly. Yeah, well, look, I, I remember when when the kids were watching that stuff, man. I was like, wait a minute, saved yeah. by the bell, really? Yeah. Oh man, does anybody even remember who was on Saved by the Bell? Really? I mean, uh, well, I just wanted to incorporate a screech reference and a few extra bucks today. <laughs> Yeah, we could have a few of those. Yeah, who would be the Buck Screech? Do they have a Screech? Wow. That's a good question. Yeah. Wow. At the, you know what? That should, that should be in three and out later. Maybe we'll bring that yeah, back. Who would be the Buck Screech? You can, you can toss that one in there. You give me a little bit of time to think it over, obviously. I can think of some media guys who would definitely qualify as Screech. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. In fact, <laughs> most of the media core is, is a bunch of Screeches. <laughs> All right, well, let's get to the game. You know, um, here's my take on the Bucks right now. I, I, obviously, we have a lot of takes, but the one that's front and center is, Roy, there is no quarterback controversy. I'm so tired of hearing that. In my eyes, and you know Dirk Cutter and Jason Light, they're not going to sit Fitz Magic. I don't care if Winston comes back. Uh, if he keeps playing like this, there's no way they're sitting. And what is this quarterback controversy? There isn't. You're right. There isn't one. I, 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 I've been hearing about this now for – you know, for for three four days now, and I'm like, well, what are you talking? What con- there's no controversy. You're you've got the best player in the NFL, arguably at least one of the five, I guess. Put you know, let's be honest. Uh, certainly the best player on the team. You don't sit the best player on the team. We talked about that before. Um, there is no quarterback controversy. And if one suddenly develops as a result of Ryan Fitzpatrick playing poorly uh, next Monday, well, let's address it then. But right now, there's no question who's going to play that first game back in Chicago when Jameis Winston is back. It's going to be Ryan Fitzpatrick unless he's hurt, and it should be Ryan Fitzpatrick. He's earned the opportunity. He's got this team doing things they've never done before. So absolutely, it's going to be him. You know what's kind of funny about this supposed controversy is I hear people all the time. You know, it's funny when when, when the NFL in the NFL when some when a team drafts a bunch of guys right on draft day, everybody thinks those players should automatically be in the lineup right away. Okay. 
Right. And if they're not, they think they're busts and everything right. else. And then they find out that, you know, well, that's probably not the best way to go. They need to learn a little bit. And now, and, and because nobody, nobody wants to know about, they want, they want everything right now, right? They want everything right now. It's not, it's not good enough to wait two years and let the guys develop, let them earn their spot. No, they want them in there right now. And if they're not in there right now, well, then they've wasted the draft pick. Well, now all of a sudden you hear people saying, well, James Winston's the future of the team. We really need to think about the future. Wait a minute. All of a sudden we don't care about the right now. Now we care about the future. Right. It's like, wait a minute. You got a chance to win right now, folks. Win right now. Worry about the future when it comes. The, the good part about right now, if you're a Bucks fan, is getting John Gruden right now back in 2002 and deal with the draft picks later. You know, it's like to, to your point, you know, if you're going to win, if you're going to take care of it for a franchise at that point, he never won a Super Bowl, you know, go for it then because you had the team and you made some moves. And right now the team has not made the playoffs and hasn't won a playoff game since then. Yeah, you appreciate the here and now. But you know what? That's the way our society is. I sound like a get off my lawn guy, but with social media and everything else, well, that's kind of where we are, isn't it? No, you're right. Uh, that's exactly where we are. Um, and look, you, you can't overstate 2-0. and It's like all of a sudden already, I mean, after two weeks, people are taking for granted what Ryan Fitzpatrick has done for this team. They're enjoying the heck out of it, but at the same time, they're sort of taking it for granted and saying, oh, yeah, that's great, but he's going to break down at some point anyway, so get get Winston back in there. <laughs> you can't do that, and, it, and it's just not how this game is played at this level. This game is played at this level for one reason, to win the game, and uh, the best way to win right now is to keep Ryan Fitzpatrick in there. My guess is that he will probably earn an opportunity to come out of the lineup uh, at some point it, within the next month, month and a half. Um, but I wouldn't be pulling him until he uh, until he has at least, you know, at least one and maybe even two bad games in a row. Even if he has a bad game, I think he's earned the right to try to bounce back from a bad game before you, t- you pull him out of there permanently. No doubt about it. Here's Dirk Cutter on uh, what he's going to do when Winston returns in a week. I won't be the one getting into that because, you know, we'll worry about that when the time comes. Right now, you know, we're going to. Right after, right after I get out of here, we're gonna, we're gonna start working on Pittsburgh, and that's all that matters right now. You know, everything, everything else is in the future because it could all change just like that. Like I, I thought that was a good answer by Dirk. Very smart, Dirk. Don't don't touch that one with the ten, ten foot pole, right? Well, he's right because he's, he's the, the the biggest point of that is is right now there is no reason to even think about it because a lot of things could change. Which is our point. Exactly. Yes. And that Chicago game. But right now, yeah, they have to worry about Pittsburgh. They can't be worried. Again, they're not worried about a player who's not with them right now. Um, It's just like they're not, they're probably not too worried about Vita Vea at this point because he's not ready to play for him. Now, if he comes back on Wednesday, that changes. But um, we know Jameis Winston is not coming back on Wednesday or Thursday or Friday uh, of this week. So uh, there's no reason to even think about uh, that issue just yet. Uh, Plenty of time to worry about that. Uh, after next Monday night, but let's get through that first and see where we are then. But Dirk Cutter is enjoying the here and now, and that's Ryan Fitzpatrick throwing for over 800 yards in his first two games and eight touchdown passes. Here is uh, Cutter on the state of the team, including his quarterback. His numbers are off the charts. So, I mean, I guess how would you expect him, everybody to respond? Of course, everybody's and uh, responding well, and our team's, our team's playing well. Our team's doing something that not many thought they could. Uh, we, have a, we have a good locker room. Our guys, our guys believe in each other right now. So uh, any player that's playing well, I mean, he's backing it up with his play. You know, you, you, get, what, you get what you deserve. Be envious, the rest of the league. The Bucks have Ryan Fitzpatrick, and you don't. And enjoy the ride. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Roy, here's my other point, Roy. When you win in the NFL and you have a you know a playoff type team, you know you need to ha- you need to have things go your way. And it's to me remarkable that all of a sudden you know, the Bucks play the Eagles, they beat them, and oh Carson Carson Wentz all of a sudden he's available next week. Now maybe some of that is they're playing the Indianapolis Colts, but the Bucks didn't have to worry about Carson Wentz. And well, 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 look what's coming in. Maybe the biggest three-ring circus in the NFL, the Pittsburgh Steelers right now. Le'Veon Bell is taking pictures on a, I don't know, Carnival Cruise Line somewhere. And Antonio Brown threatening to quit, yelling at his coaches. 
The Steelers look like they're a mess right now. So maybe things are aligning for the Bucs on top of the good play. It sort of does seem that way, doesn't it? I mean, look, they've gone out and earned both of the victories that they've put up so far, the Buccaneers. Um, done it uh, despite some, uh, some some issues on defense. Offense has obviously been been right on, you know, hitting it right on the screws. Uh, you're right. The NFL has a reason to be envious of this uh, football team right now. They're doing things that a, a lot of teams can only dream of. And, and lo and behold, as you said, here come the Steelers who, again, we, t- we talk about this a lot, you and I, Mike, about how everybody got so worked up uh, as soon as the, uh, the schedule came out, worried about, you know, oh, my gosh, look at these three games. And, look, you can't take away the fact that based on what happened last year, this was the three toughest games that any team's ever had to start uh, a season with in, in the Super Bowl era. And, uh, and so it looked like a, a daunting task. But let's wait until you get to those games and actually see what's out there first. And, I mean, this may be a Steelers team without Le'Veon Bell. Who knows where Antonio Brown's going to be? Who knows where his head's going to be if he is on the yeah. field? And, right. uh, you know, uh, what's the rest of the team like? So, uh, yeah, this, the, the Bucks have, uh, have caught, it seem, seemingly caught a bit of a break here. It's up to them to, again, this week, Take advantage of it. They, they took advantage of the fact that their offense was uh, just steam, steaming hot in uh, uh, New Orleans, took advantage of the same situation again last week, and the absence of Carson Wentz against uh, Philadelphia got an opportunity to do something similar again here this week. So, yeah, anxious to see how they handle it. You know, it's not perfect in Buckland right now by any means, uh, especially when you look at the running game. I know uh, Dirk Cutter wants that to improve. He addressed that uh, Monday after the second one of the year. We need to run the football better. We, we had too many MEs in the run game, and uh, MEs, whether it's in the run game or the pass game, are not good, and we, you know, we have to do better. We're, we're scoring points, and that's the bottom line. you got to score more points than your opponent. Uh, so, of course, there's, you guys are all going to pick out the stuff we need to get better on, uh, get better at, and believe me, we know what we need to get better at. And they need to get better, but the, the good news for the Bucs, if they get better, boy, how dangerous will this offense be? Yeah, that, that's the thing that I think if I'm, if I'm outside of Tampa Bay right now, if I'm Pittsburgh, for example, if I'm Chicago – uh, who's not worrying about the Bucks just yet? But uh, if I'm a team up on the schedule pretty soon, and I'm a scout, I'm I'm worried because yeah, the, the offense is going, but it's going basically uh, without one of the Pistons firing on a regular basis, and uh, that is the running game. And uh, Dirk's right, um, you know, uh, had some missed assignments in in that game, a uh, couple of missed uh, uh, you know blocks here and there, so um, that's hurt them. Um, it's kept them from really uh, maxing out on offense, which is almost impossible. You know, it's it's rather difficult to to even suggest because you look at it, and it's like at 48 points in one game, 27 in the next against the Super Bowl champions. Uh, you know, it's hard to argue that th- this offense isn't uh, hitting it on, on you know on all on all cylinders, but it's really not. So yeah, if they can get something going, and you know what, maybe this is the opportunity. Maybe this is where they give uh, Ronald Jones an opportunity, saying, hey, you know what. Uh, as much as you struggled, um, nobody else has really stepped up and given us what we're looking for consistently. Now, Peyton Barber did it in week one, but last week, not the same. So uh, maybe this is an opportunity for Ronald Jones to, to prove that uh, he can give him something, give him a, a bit of a spark and a boost because they could use it in that uh, portion of the offense for sure. He just needs to do the little things. That's what he hasn't done. Obviously, he hasn't had the burst that uh, we all expected for a second-round pick and a guy who's such a speedster. But, yeah, the opportunity is there because the offensive line is a lot better, Roy. We've talked about that. He has all the the weapons around him. You know, if he can make some noise, obviously he'll have some more opportunities. But, you know, looking at this football team, I think it's interesting. The dynamic, you know, they had to improve the defensive line. And improving the defensive line made the offensive line better. And Dirk Cutter talked about that Monday. We wanted to have a harder training camp. Uh, we tried to make it a harder training camp, but the the defensive line set the tempo for that, and then the offensive line had to adjust or or get crushed. And you know that's not going to happen. I mean, uh, George George isn't going to let the O line get crushed, and Buck's not going to let the D line get crushed. So uh, that's that definitely happened, and that that helped our team in in more ways than one. That's huge, Roy. Yeah, it is. And I think it's something, you know, that, uh, 
it, a lot of people maybe lose sight of that uh, when you make one side better, everybody else is going to get better because you're out there every day facing them. And just in order to get through a practice, you, you got to, you got to pump it up a little bit. So um, yeah, the, the addition of talent on the defensive line facing a better offensive line, uh, it's just going to naturally make players better. And I think uh, we're, we're starting to see uh, just little by little, we're starting to see the fruits of that, um, which is big because this team needs that D line to really come through. Um, you know, one of the things I think that was lost in the game against uh, Philadelphia, the Bucks had a, about a dozen pressures in that game. They, uh, they, they brought it. They had three sacks, about a dozen pressures, and um, that's, that's what you're looking for. So uh, that, they can have afternoons like that from the D-line every, uh, every week. They're, they're going to be happy. You know, we're going to d- delve into the Steelers and preview that game in our podcast on Thursday. But, you know, we want to talk about intangibles for this team. You know, obviously Fitzpatrick's been huge and guys have stepped up, young guys on defense. I mean, Dirk Cutter's talked about, even in the heat uh, the other day, you know, eight guys on defense had 70 or more plays. Uh, the guys are stepping up on both sides of the football. Uh, but I think the dynamics of training camp uh, helped this football team in, in, in trenches on both sides of the ball. And then you have communication. I think this is a closer football team. And, and I thought, you know, you could say what you want about the NFL – and uh, the anthem and and everything along that has gone with that. But I thought the Bucks had a great thing today. And you see it around the NFL is uh, the social justice initiative. Um, they're going to have monthly events focused on youth empowerment, police relations, criminal justice reform, racial equality, and workforce development. And you saw different players on the Bucks today head to the Tampa Police Department to uh, to learn about these issues. Deshaun Jackson was there. Gerald McCoy was there. Ali Marpet was there. Donovan Smith was there. And, you know, members of the media were there as well. It was a good way. Uh, members of the Buccaneer hierarchy were there, too. You had Mayor Tampa Mayor Bob Buckhorn, B- B- Buckhorn there as well. But, you know, it's all about, to me, communicating when you have a problem that the NFL has. Instead of the owners just saying, hey, we're going to let these guys sit in the locker room in the first, you know, when the anthem's playing. Let's talk it out. Let's work it out. Let's get in the community and find out what the problems are. Talk to law enforcement. Talk to the uh, mayor of Tampa. Bring these people together. And along those same lines of communication, uh, the Bucks tweak things this offseason. Dirk Cutter talked about that as well. We tried to get the players talking more in front of the other players. Uh, we did things, uh, uh, especially on the defensive side of the ball, Coach Smith and, and the defensive staff going clear back into OTAs, had different players uh, talk about their life and where they came from, you know, a way to get to know guys. Uh, we had players talk different players talk on different topics during training camp and uh you know i think it's just good for those guys to hear each other talk that's great stuff roy all around yeah it really is i like the whole idea of uh the 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 players getting out there and meeting with the with law enforcement and and beginning this whole initiative i mean this is a real step forward um for those who believe uh and i believe rightfully so that uh you know there's some people are treated differently in this country. Um, you know, this is a way to get out there and start to understand the other side, what it is they're seeing. Um, it always helps. You know, you got to have both sides of the story to understand it completely. And, you know, we've heard the player's argument, um, but I like the fact that they're uh, being proactive and getting involved and in, uh, trying to find out, you know, what's, what is it like on the other side? What's really going on there? What are they seeing? What are they learning? What do they know? Um, it's a great way to, uh, uh, at least take a big step forward in helping to resolve some of these issues. And uh, uh, like, uh, like you said earlier, Mike, this is a way to, and like Dirk kind of alluded to, this is a way, you know, don't, don't stay in the locker room, get out on the field with your teammates. And if you want to really do something about this issue, well, let's all get together here. And as a group, let's go, uh, let's go talk to some people and see, uh, see what can be done. And I, I know for a fact that, um, the people on that law enforcement side appreciate uh, in a great way the, the players coming out and taking a, a real interest in trying to uh, resolve this issue because it, it's out there. They know it. Everybody knows it. And, and you can't ignore it. Ignoring it's not the right answer. And uh, uh, this is why sometimes uh, protests like we've seen over the last year or so, uh, sometimes there is a silver lining there and not everybody wants to see it. Probably nobody wants to see it, but they're there for a reason. And if you make a move forward with it as a result of that, uh, that's good. This is a big step forward for everybody. I like it. 
And, and to your point, you know, Deshaun Jackson had this quote today that I, I thought really summed up the whole experience. He said, this experience really helped us gain a better understanding of the pressures and responsibilities that the police have in doing their jobs. Today was an important first step in gaining a better understanding of how we bring about change. Hallelujah. Finally. I mean, this should have been going on uh, right <clears throat> right when all the anthem controversy hit. It's uh, It'll be interesting to see the fallout from all this. It has to be positive moving forward. Though. You know what's interesting is this is kind of the, what the Bucks are doing right now is very similar, I think, in scope to something that Tony Dungy suggested. Uh, he was asked the question, if you were a coach right now and this issue was going on, if you were coaching a team right now, how would you handle it with your team? And his answer, I thought, was it was brilliant, really. Uh, I shouldn't be surprised from Tony Dungy. Uh, he said, I would have the players that, that want to protest. I would say, instead of taking a knee during the anthem, um, you know, I respect your right to do that. But instead of doing that, he says, what's the message that you want to get across? I'll give you five minutes uh, or ten minutes of my time during the week, uh, my press conference time with the media, I'll give 10 of those minutes to each of the players that wants to say something about this issue, and I'll give that time to you, and that's your opportunity. Go out and tell people what is it, what's the point you want to get across? What's, what is what has upset you, and what do you think has to be done to correct it? I'll give you my time in order to make that happen. And, and I just thought, like, boy, how hard is that? How hard is that? And I think this is very similar to that. I think this is kind of a – a variation on that theme. And, uh, and I think it's, again, I think it's a good step forward for everybody. You know, on top of everything we discussed, uh, there was another part of the day where players and police officers uh, participated in a closed door discussion to share their thoughts and ideas relating to, uh, you know, race relations and, and, and everything that we've talked about. You know, all these people who want to boycott the NFL because they don't agree with Colin Kaepernick should see stories coming out of this event today. I think it would change their minds. I think it would give them better perspective. I know the players learned something today. I'm sure the police officers did too. I think people are always, you know, Democrat, Republican, uh, anthem, no anthem. It's it's black or white. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, we're, this is a football podcast, but I think the NFL has a, a problem in that regard. But I think events like this today, if you're not going to watch the NFL because of Colin Kaepernick or Eric Reed or whoever's protesting, you need to pay attention to stories like this. Yeah, you do. Um, look, this is this is look. Yeah, the NFL started this, all right. The players started this, and for a good, the better part of the last year, um, most of the answers for the people who didn't like what they were seeing were okay. Well, what are you doing about it? And I think well, that, that was a valid question. It's one thing to kneel uh, or, or or sit down during the anthem or or stay in the locker room during the anthem, but it's another thing to really get out there and do something. And by the way, Colin Kaepernick is doing something. And, uh, you know, you, you, you've got to look at, you know, a lot of people don't want to do the research and go and see what actually is happening. Um, but this, this again, and I'm glad that the Buccaneers are behind it, is another uh, effort to do something about it. And uh, because everybody, because they do realize there is an issue there. Uh, probably kneeling is for the anthem is not the right way to get the message across because the message gets lost that way. This way, uh, maybe it doesn't get as much attention, but at least there's some actual uh, ground roots, um, you know, action being done because there's a conversation going on between the two sides, and that's always good. Exactly. Well, I'm glad we touched on that because that was, you know, the Bucks were off today. The, the Monday night football schedule, uh, you know, pushes things forward. Obviously, uh, you know, they'd be off on a, on, on a Tuesday anyway, but, uh, you know, Wednesday um, – they're going to be off as well, but they'll be back at it Thursday, and we'll get a lot of sound on the Steelers. But uh, I wanted to address that today because I thought it was a great story and, and something. If you're a football fan, if you're if you're not boycotting the NFL, if you're if you're hanging in there and and uh, you know understand the anthem issue uh, differently than people who don't, I think either either way, it's it's a good story to look at. But we're wrapping it up, and Justin, you know what time that is? Absolutely. You know, Roy, I'm a pretty positive guy, but on three and out, this is our three and out segment. That's the great music. Uh, it's kind of your cue to know it's three and out. Uh, we appreciate everybody logging on to a few extra bucks. But if this is your first uh, time you've listened, uh, we'd like to finish up with our three and out segment. Three questions for Roy Cummings, and we are out of here. Uh, we like to stay. I, I'm a positive guy for the most part. But my first question, Roy, uh, when you look at this Bucks team, what's your biggest concern moving forward now? Is it the running attack? 
or is it the kicking game? Well, since I've got those two choices. Or you could go off the board if you want. I'm going off the board. Okay. I'm still going to say it's the secondary. Uh, okay. here's, a, here's, here's some original research for you, Mike. Um, the Buccaneers are giving up 77.4% completions against quarterbacks right now. They're, that's the worst in the league. Um, quarterbacks are completing 77.4% of their passes. Uh, let's put it a better way. And their, their passer rating against the Buccaneers is like 131. Um, that you, you got to hope that's not sustainable no. based on what we've seen the last couple of uh, years. There's a possibility that it's uh, not that far off from sustainable. So my biggest concern is the secondary still it's young. Our guy, MJ Stewart, had 10 balls thrown at him last week. All 10 were caught for about 89 yards and about 113 passer rating. Um, rough night for the kid. Absolutely a rough night. And uh, he's going to continue to see a lot of playing time, as is Carlton Davis III. Um, I just think that this, you know, I, I don't know that the, the upgrades on the defensive line are enough to cover uh, what's happening in the secondary right now. The injuries have hit him, hit him hard. The young guys are having to learn almost too fast, too soon. Uh, I think at some point uh, somebody's going to start taking big advantage of it and they're going to pay a price for it. So right now I think that's their biggest weakness. And that's the right answer. When when I think of running game, I just know it can be better. You hope it can be better with this offense. Boy, if you have both these things going, we've talked about that earlier. We've talked about that for weeks. This offense could be dangerous. But Catanzaro has missed a few here and there. And the one miss he had in New Orleans – uh, that could really kick, came back to bite this team uh, if, if Fitz doesn't get that last first down. So, uh, but I, I agree. You know, those are you know we're kind of being picky now because the Bucks are two and zero. We never thought they'd but be two and zero. But I don't think it's or, being picky, Mike. I don't think it's being picky. You have to be able to run so. the ball in this league in order to win. Yeah. Seldom do teams right. actually go out there and throw it sixty eight times and win. Um, you have to be able to run the ball, especially in this offense, because something's got to set up those play action fakes. Or, I'm sorry, someone's got to set up those deep balls, and those are play-action fakes, and those things only work if you're actually running the ball. And Chandler Catanzaro, I got the name right this time. Um, for some reason, I keep calling him Chris. But anyway, Chandler Catanzaro has put this team in a tough spot. He had a chance to put the first game away, yep. and he gave, what he ended up doing was breathing new life into the Saints. He yep. missed a, an extra point last week, which kind of gave a bit of a momentum shift uh, over to the, uh, to the Eagles. And the Bucks had to, you know, grind it out really at the end again. So he's got to be better. And uh, if he's not, that could be an issue. So out of those two, I'll take Chandler Catanzaro because I think the running game is going to be just fine. Yeah, okay. But I think you had the better answer with secondary. That's why you always make me better, Roy. Every week you make me better. All right, here's, here's, a, here's a story that I've never heard of in the NFL in my life. Here's the second of our three and out segment here. Your man, Vontae Davis – and Buffalo quitting at halftime in the loss against the Chargers. Um, a, what do you think of this story? And B, has Roy Cummings ever thought about quitting at halftime, covering a game? Maybe it was the, the job just driving you crazy, or maybe the game was just so god-awful you wanted to leave. Roy, Roy Cummings is not a quitter. Roy Cummings is not a quitter. Let me tell you that, <laughs> folks. Um, Roy Cummings, when he's having one of those uh, workouts where it's just like, are you kidding me? I'm only, you know yeah. – 20 minutes through this 35, 40 minute uh, jog here. I still got to go and I don't have anything left in me. I find a way, man. I don't quit. Extra gear, um, extra gear, baby. That's right. I, even if I got a downshift, I'm, I'm going to finish. I will not quit on anything. And for him to quit on that team, I don't know. I don't know what it means. Does it, is it something about him? Does it say something? Does it say something about the bills? Uh, well, I, I don't know, man. That, that to me, is easily the most bizarre story of the early NFL season so far. And even at the end of the year, I still think when you put together your 10 most bizarre stories of the season, that's going to be on the list because a guy quitting uh, at halftime. What I want to know is did he, did he get out of uniform or did he just walk out of the building, you know, with the uniform still on and say, that's, I, I ain't taking this. <laughs> like he's in the stands eating a hot yeah. dog in the second. Yeah. Half. <laughs> You know, I just – I don't care what Vontae Davis has done in his career, and he had 10 seasons in the NFL. He was a first-round pick back in 2009. Vontae, you, the first line 
in your biography is always going to be this. I mean, do you th- obviously he didn't think it through. Maybe he did and just didn't care. He's got enough money, you know, whatever. But if you want to quit at halftime, don't you just say, you know, I don't, you know, maybe I'm hurt. I can't play. There's got to be a better way out of this, Fonte. Come on. Yeah, really. right. Exactly. Why? It, it, right. Just say, look, coach, I, I, I haven't got it today. I just think you're, you're going to be better off playing the kid. Go, let somebody go in ahead of me. Make up some excuse, but you don't quit on your team in the middle of the game. You just don't. I mean, but I, I don't know. Maybe it's an indictment on the Bills. I don't know. Maybe that that's probably what this is. It's probably somebody needs to be looking inside that organization saying, what in the world is going on there? <laughs> wait, wait. I, we haven't heard from Justin in a while. Justin, have you quit or are you still around podcast? Oh, no. I would never quit on y'all. Okay, good, good. I just want to make sure. All right, our last question in our three and out. You know, we like to mix in pop culture. I don't know what's going on with The Bachelor, The Bachelorette, and I'm sure Roy can update us on that, or maybe Justin as well. But, you know, we talked about music last week, and we, th- we talked about singers that we've never seen that we'd like to see, and we threw out some, you know, all kinds of names, um, you know, which got me thinking this week, is there an underrated singer out there that doesn't get his due, that's been around for a while, Um I don't know if you guys want to think about it. I have a few on, on my on my list here. Um, I, I want to get your thoughts on this. I'll let you guys kind of percolate a little bit because I, I knew what the question was and you didn't have time to really think about it. But I have two guys, okay? You just give me a yay or a nay, all right? Bob Seger is one. And this is – I don't know if you expect this one. Michael McDonald to me is, is tremendous. The Doobie Brothers used to be the Doobie Brothers, love his solo stuff. I, I don't think Michael McDonald or Bob Seger ever got their due. All right. What do you think? All right, I'll start with this. Um, <laughs> let, let me take that from the back end first. I think Michael <laughs> McDonald got his due, <laughs> and and and, uh, and it was well deserved. He a great voice. Um, okay. Not a trem- I, yeah, not not one of the not one of the all time voices. Okay, I, I'm not going to put him up there with. But but you, you, look, I love the Doobie Brothers. I, I, I'd rather have the Doobie Brothers than Michael McDonald. OK, OK. Um, right. I can't really deal with Michael McDonald by himself. Doobie Brothers. <laughs> absolutely. Um, I'd say one of the more underrated bands. Now, Bob Seger, okay. in my opinion, is one of the most overrated oh. rock and roll artists of all time. <laughs> now, I'm not saying he, he's here. Here's here's my, here's my thing on him. There's two songs of his that I love. And there are probably two songs that, that most most Bob Seger fans don't care about main street and against the wind. Those are superb songs. Bob Seger didn't do enough of that. If he'd done more of those, he would have gotten his just due. You don't like, what about old time rock and roll? You don't like that one? No, Uh, that song. You're thinking of Tom Cruise dancing around in his underwear and risky business. That ruined that song. it, 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 It did. And it's overplayed and it's not that great. And, um, oh man, you're killing I'm me. sorry, but that's, that's my you know, opinion. So that, you know, you know, know who also doesn't like Michael McDonald. If you're a family guy fan, they just obliterate Michael McDonald all the time on that show. <laughs> As they did in the 40 year old virgin, by the way, it, it was subtle, but yes. if you remember, you know, there's that clip of him constantly playing on the TV sets and, and they just, they just, they just can't take it anymore. <laughs> I got to stick up for my boy, Michael McDonald, though. It's not annoying. It's distinct. And there's a difference. That's all I'm saying. Here's the thing, though. The Doobie Brothers were great. Even I, Boy, I can't believe I just used the word great. But they were. <laughs> um, they were good. They were really good. I, I don't know if they were great. Yeah. But they were really good. I mean, they had, what, half a dozen mega hits. So they were really good without Michael McDonald. Okay? I mean, they were, right. you know, long train running. Uh, well, it was Michael McDonald, I guess. But, you know, listen to the music. Uh, China Grove. They, what a fool believes. They, they didn't. They didn't need you know Michael McDonald. Those were just good songs, no matter who's singing them. Roy, you know what? We all need a little Michael McDonald. Just, just so you know. Okay. Well, all right. The floor is you. I, I, I'm, I'm tired of getting abused here. You guys take it away from here. What, what do you got for your underrated? Do you have any underrated I, guys? I, I honestly think in in rock and roll right now we've gotten to the point where everybody's overrated. Because all you got to yeah. do is, is you know, I mean, there's a bunch. Look at all the look at all the bands that are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's the Hall of Fame. 
It's not the hall of, oh, yeah, we had a couple of songs that were pretty good. I mean, that, <laughs> right. you know, Rush is in there. I touched a nerve. I love it. I touched it. I touched it. You know what, though? I, I will say this. You know, when you, when you talk about – have you been to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Yes, I have. Absolutely. That place is, that place is tremendous. Yeah, and, and, and you know what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, it's unfortunate. I mean, Elvis has a room, okay, which is deserved. Yes. Here's a mistake. The Beatles only have a wall. That's, that's, that's wrong. Yeah. Uh-oh. That's wrong. Oh. Hey, I will say this, though, about the, your man, Bob Seger. Do you know who uh, he mentored growing up? One of his, uh, and wanted to tour with him as a youngster, but couldn't because his mom wouldn't let him, is one Glenn Fry. Wow. That's pretty I'm interesting. Just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. The Eagles documentary, if you watch it, uh, he was uh, mentored by Bob Seger, wanted wanted to tour with him. But Mama Fry said, not a chance, youngster. You know, wait. You can just wait, uh, get your education. Maybe one day you'll meet Don Henley. And, uh, and I guess it worked out. Is that out the him, history but, you know. of the Eagles documentary? Yes, very good documentary, yeah, by the way. Yeah, it's outstanding. Tremendous. And for some reason, I, I guess I missed that. Yeah, that was uh, – we I know we're, getting, we're going way off here from Screech to Bob Seger, but I have one more thing I'll say about the Eagles. Is that documentary, if we're watching the same one, I love the uh, how they mic'd them up on stage when, they're, when they got to a point where they hated each other, and they're basically saying, I'm going to kick your ass when we get off the stage. Yeah. Right now. Is that, does that the one you saw? Yeah, that was pretty wild, man. That was pretty wild. That's a tremendous yeah. documentary. I mean, yeah. it really uh, gets you in. It also shows you, you know – I kind of hate to say it, but, you know, what kind of a, a dweeb uh, uh, Glenn Fry was. I mean, I yeah. understand it's your band, man, and you started it, and you basically – but you know what? Everybody played a part in that band. And um, I understand you you did most of the singing and a lot of songwriting, but son of a gun, give, give, give a couple of guys their due there, man. Don Henley was the heart and soul of that band. I'm sorry. Yeah. It, uh, I th- in my, I mean, the guy could play multiple instruments. And you saw when they broke up in the 80s, Don Henley's solo career to me was much more impressive than Glenn Frost. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree. Yeah. Hey, Mike. Okay. I love Michael McDonald, by the way. What do you got, Justin? Remember when you asked if uh, I was if there was ever a time I quit halfway through something? Yes. <laughs> you should have asked me now. <laughs> I'm asking. Oh, you want to quit right now? <laughs> Maybe like a lot of people, they're quitting on this podcast. Exactly. <laughs> Man, you know, y'all went down a road that I am not familiar with. Oh, my goodness. Well, you know what? That's what makes this podcast great is because we don't just talk about sports. I mean, we covered it all today. I love the fact that we touched on social issues. We went from Screech to Seeger. We, we, hit, we touched them all, didn't we? Yeah, I think we did. We, did. we touched on a lot of topics. And that's the kind of you know versatility and uh, that you get out of us when you listen to this podcast, man. That's right. You never know what you get. Well, exactly. Well, listen, we're going to box of chocolates, <laughs> which exactly. wasn't Tom Hanks' best movie, and he got the Academy Award. Okay, what was his um, best movie? I don't... You know what? You know what? No, 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 no. We're going to table that to next oh. week. We're going to we're going to tease him. No, no, we're going to tease him because if you've stuck around this long, folks to a few extra bucks. We love you, by the way. And I'm sorry for saying ass for the first time on a few extra bucks too, but it's a podcast. So basically we can say whatever we want, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm, I got to hold it right there because I want to, I want to know what that answer is to best Tom Hanks movie, because that's a, well, that's a tough question there too. I'm, I'm already writing that down. I, I never give you the three and outs, but that's one. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to give that to okay. you. All right. Well, listen, for Justin Thomas, for our Buccaneer Insider, Roy Cummings, for our title sponsors, House of Brews and Sea Dog Brewing Company, for Screech, for Michael McDonald, for Bob Seeger, for Glenn Fry, for Don Henley, this is a few extra bucks. Thanks for listening. Uh, we appreciate it. We're on iTunes now. We're picking up steam every week. Can't wait to talk to you on Thursday and uh, preview the Bucks Monday night or against the Steelers. Until next time, have a great week.